from our Bible uh, 388, page 388. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David has done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stone and cut down Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses has made. For up to that time, the Israel had been burning incense to it. It was called Nahustan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord and God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the king of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands of he, he kept the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. In King Hezekiah's fourth year, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, marched against Samaria and laid siege to it. At the end of three years, the Assyrians took it. So Samaria was captured in Hezekiah's sixth year, which, of, which was the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel. The king of Assyria deported Israel to Assyria and settled them in Hala, in Gosan, and on the river of Harbor, and in towns of the Medes. This happened because they had not obeyed the Lord their God, but had violated his covenant, all that Moses the servant of the Lord command. They neither listened to the commands nor carried them out. In the fourteen years of King Hezekiah's reign, Senat Shurit, kings of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. I've done wrong. Withdraw from me, and I will pray whatever you demand of me. The king of Assyria accepted from Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the temple of the Lord and in the treasures of the royal palace. At this time, Hezekiah, king of Judah, stripped off the gold with which he had covered the doors and doorposts of the temple of the Lord and gave to the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria sent his supreme commander, his chief officer, and his field commander with a large army from Nakish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. They came up to Jerusalem and stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. They called for the king. And Elakim, son of Hezekiah, the palace administrator, Shiba, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder ran out to them. The field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have the counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending? That you rebel against me? Look, I know you are 
depending on Egypt. The splintered reed of a staff which pleases the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. But if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to the Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How can you repulse one officer of the list of my master's officers, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Then Elikim, son of Hidika, and Shibna, and Joel, said to the field commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew, in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the commander replied, Was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say this thing, and not to the people sitting on the wall, who, like you, will have to eat their own excrement? and drink their own urine. Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot de deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern. Until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new vine, a land of bread and vineyard, a land of olive trees and honey. Choose life and not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, The Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hands of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Apep? Where are the gods of Sepharvim and Hena and Eva? Have they res rescued us? Samaria from my hand, who of all the gods of this country has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people remain silent and say nothing in reply, because the king had commanded, do not answer him. Then Ekahim, son of Hedekai, and <clears throat> Pardes administrator Shibna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asab, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him what the field commander had said. Thank you very much indeed, Aaron. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well done for getting here early. Very impressive. Um, and thank you for bearing with us as we kind of embark on uh, this two services trial for this next few weeks, and then we'll um, think about over the summer and what we do from September onwards. And um, as you look around, as we've been saying for the last few weeks, as you look around on a morning like this morning, you think, oh gosh, yeah, there are quite a lot of empty seats. We've got to remember that's the point. Um, don't think of them as empty seats. Think of them as seats of opportunity. Um, seats ready and waiting to be filled. That is what we've not had in these past few months. Um, as we've been uh, wonderfully, praise the Lord, so busy um, on Sunday mornings. Uh, and so we trust that the Lord might work through this uh, to give us more room 
for growth. So please be praying on for that. And if you keep your Bibles open there on page 388 to 2 Kings chapter 18 as we think about that together in these next few minutes. God's word prepares us to live with hope in a menacing world. Specifically in a world that isn't friendly towards God's people because it doesn't think very much of God. In the 1880s, the German atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche declared that God is dead. Karl Marx wrote that religion was the opium of the masses. He believed it was a means of control. And as such, when people were liberated from their kind of socioeconomic shackles, religious faith would serve no more useful purpose. It would inevitably decline and die out. It was purely a tool of political control. Political leaders, of course, like Lenin and Stalin, Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, then took that Marxist theory and put it to the test in Soviet Russia and communist Cuba and China. Today, in the Western world, Christians and others are often belittled and derided for their faith. We are told that we are on the wrong side of history. Just to say that our views are, are stupid and wrong, looking back in the years to come, everyone will be able to see how misguided and silly believers were to trusting God, to, to base their views and their lives on the Bible. Outdated, pathetic, to take seriously those kind of things. The sort of ideas that the cosmologist Stephen Hawking described as fairy tales for people who are afraid of the dark. That kind of criticism, that kind of opposition, those kind of attempts to, to undermine belief in God, well, they make life as a Christian an uncomfortable experience. Some of us will have experienced that personally and very painfully. Some of us come from places uh, where that is systematically what happens. But even if we've been fortunate enough to avoid outright opposition and persecution as a result of our faith, then we still know, I think, that living as God's people, the world can feel like a menacing place to be. But God's word prepares us for life in this world. And so it prepares us to live with hope in a menacing world. In a world which looks and sounds and feels intimidating. And it does so because the experience of Christians today and in the recent past is not unique. It has always been this way. God's people have typically looked small and feeble and weak in the face of the powers of this world. And as a result, God's people have typically been mocked, bullied, threatened, undermined, told to give up. And that's what we're going to think about this morning, because that is the situation we find here in 2 Kings chapter 18. As we return once more to our journey through the book of Kings, we were last in this book just before Easter, when we witnessed the tragedy of the northern kingdom, Israel, being conquered by the Assyrians and taken into exile. Now, if you can't remember much about that, or if you weren't here, fear not, verses 9 to 12 of our passage this morning provides a nice, neat summary the end of three years of Shalmaneser's siege against Assyria, the Assyrians took it. Samaria was captured in Hezekiah's sixth year, verse 11. The king of Assyria deported Israel to Assyria, settled them in Hala, in Gozan, on the river Harbor, and the towns of the Medes. This happened because they had not obeyed the Lord their God, but had violated his covenant. All that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, they neither listened to the commands nor carried them out. Ever since the, the kingdom had been split in two after the death of Solomon, Israel up north has gradually slipped further and further away from true trust in the Lord. And despite God's patience and urging, despite him sending prophets like Elijah and Elisha, they would not change course. And so now there is just Judah, just the, the southern kingdom with its capital in Jerusalem, just Judah is left, just one tribe. But in Judah, there is hope. 
We've known that all the way through the story, right back in 1 Kings uh, chapter 11, when the, the kingdom first split. God had said, I will give one tribe to his son, speaking of Solomon, I will give one tribe to his son, so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name. God had promised David a king, a king from his line, not just another king, but a king unlike any other. And because God had promised, a lamp still burns in Jerusalem. And so there is hope. And actually that hope shines out here at the start of chapter 18. Out of the depths of despair, out of Israel's exile in chapter 17, this great shaft of light comes pouring in with the arrival onto the scene of King Hezekiah. Verses 1 to 4 give us the kind of summary of Hezekiah's reign. And then verse 5, that's the kind of headline highlight. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. Hezekiah trusts in the Lord. That's the crucial bit of information. That is the, the kind of the measure of the merit of any king. Hezekiah trusts in the Lord. And as a result of his trust, he does some really great things that we're told about here. Some very David-like things, actually. He destroys the high places. He defeats David's old enemies, the Philistines. And unlike his father Ahaz, he refuses to serve the king of Assyria. And Hezekiah is a reformer. He brings people back to the true worship of God. He, he gets rid of the alternative places and forms of worship. He even goes and finds the, the bronze snake that Moses had made for them in the desert so that they could look to it and be healed. They've, they've kept hold of that, but the people have started to worship it as a kind of icon instead of worshipping God. And so Hezekiah says, let's just get rid of it. It's all been downhill, and then suddenly in God's kindness, it is all looking up. Or is it? Now, I should just explain that the way that the, the chapter works, really. The first eight verses of the chapter give us a kind of overall summary of Hezekiah's reign. We're going to be thinking about Hezekiah for the next few weeks. And the first eight verses give us a summary of the whole of his reign. That's the big picture. Then we're reminded about Assyria and what they've done to the northern kingdom in verses 9 to 12. And from then on, we get into some of the detail of the events that happened during Hezekiah's reign. That's what we get from verse 13 onwards. And once we get into that, well, it could feel a little bit alarming. Because we've been told in verse 7, as part of that summary, that all was success for Hezekiah, but then absolute disaster seems to come knocking very loudly and rudely at the door. Verse 13, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. See, friends, faithfulness is not a guarantee against difficulty or against disaster. Having smashed the larger northern kingdom a few years previous, Assyria are back on the warpath and Judah is in the firing line. And so we wonder, well, how will Hezekiah respond? Well, verse 14, he sends a message to the king of Assyria at Lachish, and that's in Judah. So he sends a message to the king, as in one sense, he's encamped on Hezekiah's doorstep. And he says to him, I've done wrong, verse 14, withdraw from me and I will pay whatever you demand of me. Hezekiah gives him all the silver that was found in the temple. He strips the gold off the, the doors and the doorposts in the temple and, and gives it to the king of Assyria. Now, what are we to make of that as a response? If you've been with us as we've journeyed through kings, then you might recall that right back at the start of the book, the building and the furnishing of the temple was an absolutely magnificent and hugely significant event. It was the crowning achievement of Solomon's reign. It was a high point, in some ways the high point, in the life of God's people. But since then, as we've worked through, that the glory of the temple has gradually faded. It's gradually been traded away. And that sorry story continues here. The, the silver from the treasuries, the gold that's only just been restored. 
It's only just been put back on the doors and the doorposts, but stripped off and sent away to try and placate Assyria. It's not good. I think what happens here in verses 14 to 16 represents what we could fairly describe as a wobble in Hezekiah's trust in Yahweh. As he finds himself in this difficult situation, he reaches firstly desperately for a human solution to the Assyria problem. And that's a bit dispiriting. But let me say, I think there's also something strangely encouraging in this for us. Because Hezekiah is compared so favourably to David. We're told at the beginning of this section about him that he is really a wonderful example. You don't get a better example in a, in a king of Judah than Hezekiah. But there is also something quite David-like, isn't there? Someone who is so lauded for their faith. He trusted in the Lord. He held fast to him and we think, gosh, I wish I were like that. And then we see what that looks like and we find that just like David, it sometimes looks like being fallible and weak and making a bad call when faced with difficult circumstances. Hezekiah has true faith, but it doesn't mean he always got it right. He had true faith because he kept on. He kept on putting his imperfect faith in a perfect God. We can do that. But his attempt to solve the problem by buying favour with Sennacherib, well, that was misguided as shown by the fact that it was totally unsuccessful. No sooner has Hezekiah sent off his his silver and gold to to try and pay his way to peace than there are Assyrian military officials clippity-clopping along the road to Jerusalem to issue deathly threats and to demand surrender. And for the rest of our time this morning, I just want us to think about how they do that to consider what these Assyrian guys come and say in their attempts to to threaten and unsettle Hezekiah and his people, to undermine their trust in God and to reduce and ultimately remove their hope in him. That's what they're trying to achieve here, these, these Assyrian officials. There are two key ideas really in their speeches, the ideas of trust and deliverance. That is what the Assyrian advance guard wants to target and undermine. They want to say, don't trust God. He won't deliver. That's the kind of the the overall message. But there are a few different ways that that message is packaged. There's a few different angles that they take. And those things shouted up at the wall in Jerusalem 2,700 odd years ago, they are essentially really the same sort of things that we hear today. And I think that has the potential to really help us. Knowing that these things aren't new, in one sense, the things that we hear today, the things that are said about and and to Christians today are the same things, the same ways that people have always attacked God's people. Well, I hope it might help us to keep hoping, to keep trusting, even in the face of a menacing world now. To do as they did in some ways, in verse 36, the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded, do not answer him. The people don't respond because for all their fear in the face of menace, their hope is in the Lord and in his faithful king. Just as today, we know that for all the world's attacks, our hope and trust is in God and in our king and deliverer the Lord Jesus. So let's work through. Now we're going to go fairly quickly, so keep up. Uh, Good, where do we start? So verses 20 and 22, here's the first attack. You guys are divided hypocrites. That's what they want to say in verses 20 to 22. Pick it up there, verse 20. You say you have the counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look, I know that you're depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on me. But if you say to me, we're depending on the Lord, our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed? 
saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem. The Assyrian field commander begins his verbal assault. He begins to seek to undermine their trust in the Lord by questioning really whether in fact they trust the Lord at all. On whom are you depending, he says at the end of verse 20. And then in verse 21 he says, ah, I know who you're really trusting in. You're trusting in Egypt. Judah had a military alliance of some sort with Pharaoh, one likely which Hezekiah inherited rather than initiated. It wasn't much use to them. But the Assyrians pour scorn on it as an indication that they don't really trust in God. If they did, they wouldn't be buddying up with Egypt. And then they continue on in verse 22. Oh, you'll say you're trusting in the Lord... But you guys can't even agree on how you're supposed to worship the Lord. I mean, hasn't Hezekiah just been taking down loads of Yahweh stuff? High places, altars and all that. You put it together and the argument is, you guys say that you're trusting in God, but you're hypocrites. You're trusting in other things, really. And you can't even agree on what trusting in God looks like. It's clever, of course. You try and find the cracks and then widen them still happens, of course, just the same way. You guys are hypocrites. If you really trusted in God, well, then you'd give all your money away. Christianity isn't about trusting in God. It's about rich people trying to keep political control. Or why should we take Christianity seriously when there are so many different churches, so many different denominations? Whenever I see Christians on the news, they're just arguing with each other. And if you can't agree on what's true and what's not, well then why should the rest of us even bother? The people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded do not answer him. The people don't respond because for all their fear in the face of menace, their hope is in the Lord and in his faithful king. They move on. Look how pathetic you are. That's the next thing they want to say. In verses 23 and 24. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you're depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Judah is small. Geographically, economically, militarily, she looks totally overmatched. We'd give you the horses for the battle ourselves, say the Assyrians, but you wouldn't have enough people to ride them. <laughs> Pathetic. The media gleefully reports about church decline in this country, even when that's only a very partial story. In fact, if you think about the portrayal of the church and Christians in this country, it is not universally, but generally depicted as tiny, grey and ridiculous. The main perception many people in our nation will have of what a church is like probably comes from the Vicar of Dibley or Fleabag. It's a joke. Sometimes subtly, sometimes more overtly, the message is there. Trusting in God, really. Have a look at yourselves. Look how pathetic you are. But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded, do not answer him. The people don't respond because for all their fear in the face of menace and for all that they know, their own human weakness, their trust is in the Lord and in his faithful king. Verse 25, here's the next angle. We're doing God's work. Furthermore, they say, I've come to, have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. You guys think you're trusting in God, but God's on our side. We're doing God's work. Interesting, isn't it? That's what Jesus tells the disciples in 
John 16, he says, they will kill you and they will think they are offering a service to God. Maybe today people say the same thing because they think they are serving God, even though that God isn't the God of the Bible. We prayed earlier for, for Afghanistan. People there persecuted in the name of doing God's work. And of course, even as we saw in Jude, there are those who say to the true people of God, oh, we're doing God's work. But we've had a new word, we've had a fresh revelation. It might be Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses, liberal, progressive theology. We're doing what God says, really. And we can feel so confused, can't we? It's so easy to, to doubt and to waver. What if God has spoken, as it were, to the Assyrians or to Joseph Smith? What if they have a word that we don't? But Hezekiah knew that he had God's word. We know that we have God's word because God's word is timeless and his promises don't change. The people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded, do not answer him. The people don't respond because for all their fear in the face of menace, their hope is in the Lord who has spoken and in his faithful promised king. Next up, they lose a little bit of subtlety. God can't help you. At this point, they, um, the Judean officials try and stop the field commander speaking in a language that the people can understand, but to no avail. Verse 27, was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the people sitting on the wall who, like you, will have to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine? Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, so everybody understands it, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says, do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't trust in God, he says, because God can't help you. Hezekiah can't help you. His God can't help you. Fairy tales for people who are afraid of the dark, as Stephen Hawking put it. God, Jesus, heavenly kingdom, honestly can't actually believe that. It's just a story. It's just ancient myths. You might as well believe in the invisible spaghetti monster. It's one of Richard Dawkins' favourite lines. And it's so easy to think, isn't it, as the people sitting on the wall must have thought, are we mad? Are we just crazy to believe that this is actually true, that we really should trust in God, that God really can deliver us? That through his king, Jesus, and through his death on the cross, we really are saved from sin and death forever. I mean, are we just nuts? And the answer, of course, is no. Absolutely not, friends. But God's people have always been told that they are. The Assyrians yelled it at the wall. 2,700 years later, God is faring better than the Assyrian Empire and all those who have come after them. We're almost there, but here is the next ploy in verses 31 and 32. It's better over here. Come and join us. Better food, they say, better drink, better life. Choose life and not death. It's a ploy, of course, that the Assyrian field commander has taken straight from the playbook of the snake in Eden. Life is worse if you stick with God. Why not do whatever you want? Why not drink whatever you want? Why not sleep with whoever you want? Wouldn't that be better? Come on. Come join us. Like Lady Folly in the book of Proverbs with her house full of wine and well-aged meats. 
summoning people in. But Solomon says there, only the dead are there. It's a scam. The king of Assyria is not a kind and generous master. He mimics the promises of God here. But he won't deliver them. And we know when the, the siren call of the world reaches our ears, come join us. That the promises are hollow. Some of us will have been and tried and come back thirsty and starving because God's way is always better. But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded, do not answer him. The people don't respond because for all their fear in the face of menace, their hope is in the Lord and in his faithful king. In verses 33 and 34, we get the final throw of the dice. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena and Iva? Have they rescued Assyria Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? This is the final verbal arrow that the field commander fires. You will lose, he says to them. It is inevitable. Judah, he says, if you persist in trusting in, uh, in God, you persist in listening to, to Hezekiah, you will be on the wrong side of history. Nietzsche, Marx, the evolutionary atheists, the, the progressives, they all say the same thing. If you side with God, you will be on the wrong side of history. But in verse 35, the Assyrian shouter in chief has overstepped his mark. Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem? from my hand because you see what he's done he's just lumped the lord in with all the other gods of all the other nations but the one true almighty living god is not like any other the god who is before all things over all things the god who made all things who orders all things the god who speaks the god who makes and keeps promises the God who by his faithful king has delivered and will deliver his people. He is not like any other. They don't respond. And they go away fearful. They go away tearing their clothes to report back to Hezekiah. But they go away with hope because they trust in God and in his faithful king. And we will come back in subsequent weeks and we will see what happens next. I don't want to spoil it for you, but God wins. Opposition, attack, attempts to undermine faith and trust in God and to remove hope from God's people, that is nothing new. The opponents have come and gone and others have come in their place. But God remains unmoved and unmatched. And friends, we can trust in him to deliver through his faithful king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the record of history has been preserved for us. 
um, so that we might learn from it. We thank you for the way in which you have recorded the, the record of these events. You've recorded for us what was said on that day as the enemies of your people uh, came to, to besiege and attack them. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the, the strange encouragement that we find in the way that those words then echo down through the centuries and still sound today in the way that, that people would seek to undermine trust in you, the way that people would uh, make the claim that you cannot deliver. But Heavenly Father, we thank you that we know that human weakness, that unlikely looking circumstances are no barrier to you being at work. In fact, they are the very conditions in which your power and glory is most clearly demonstrated. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, in the face of a, um, a face of a menacing world, face of a, a world in which um, we hear these kind of things said, that we may be on the receiving end of them, that you would help us to keep trusting in you, to keep trusting in Christ, our Deliverer and our King. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.